Welcome to Data Science Perspectives. This series focuses on analytics and data science professionals from across industry to learn about how their career unfolded, what skills they look for when hiring, and what trends they think are coming next. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Let's get to it. Welcome to this episode of Data Science Perspectives. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Today, I'm going to be joined by Carol Piovison. I first met Carol a number of years back when we both presented at a conference that was focused on the ethics and laws surrounding data and AI. I really liked what she had to say at the event and ended up inviting her to do a webinar for my company. We've just stayed in touch ever since. Carol has a very interesting background compared to many people I have on the, on the webcast. After getting degrees in political science, she spent several years in government with Canada's Global Affairs Office. Then after getting a law degree, she spent about a decade with a firm, McCarthy Tetro, in their national cybersecurity, privacy, and data management group. It was there that she began to focus heavily on the legality surrounding data analytics and AI. More recently, she founded both a legal firm, Inc. Law, and a consulting firm, Inc. IQ Consulting, that focused on helping companies navigate the ever-changing laws surrounding data and AI today. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto's Law School. She has a bachelor's in political science from McGill University, a master's in developmental studies from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a law degree from York University. And with that, let's welcome Carol to the show. Hey, Carol, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's interesting to me because you came into uh, the world of data and analytics, not as a practitioner, uh, but from the legal side. So from that perspective, what drew you into data and analytics? It was, so I entered this space around 2017. And this was after um, a you know, relatively in extensive uh, career in litigation already, commercial litigation, nothing to do with data in particular. But when I started reading about artificial intelligence, it, for me, tweaked a number of really interesting legal issues, particularly as you started to get into more complex and autonomous systems where the sort of fundamental principles of liability, so the sort of attribution of harm and responsibility, start to break down because those relationships are governed by law um, as between individuals. And as I was reading more about autonomous systems, I was thinking, well, there's going to be a problem here. Like if you've got an autonomous system that is able to interpret or, you know, evolve with the data environment and then action independently, that sort of liability attribution becomes really challenging. And that got me down a very deep rabbit hole of artificial intelligence and how do you create AI systems and what goes into it and what are the implications. Um, and as a result of that, it became very clear to me by 2018 you know, that we were going to need some governance, whatever that looks like, to help us evolve with the technology in a way that maintains some clarity of rules and accountability for the use of these systems. And I'm joining you from Toronto, Canada. Um, and back in 2018, the Canadian government were presidents of the G7. Uh, and I assisted our government in drafting a position statement on um, AI for the G7. Um, and as a result of that, I was able to come to the, the ministers' meetings and listen to our representatives talk about what they were worried about when it comes to artificial intelligence. It was a topic back in 2018 that was still quite hot. And what was really fascinating to me is that they were talking a lot about the worries around our values and how these systems can become so advanced and autonomous that they could potentially be used in a manner that would subvert sort of democratic values. Uh, and that to me was just clarify, it was validating that we are entering a new space where new law or some form of regulation, whether government-led or self-regulation, would be sought after. And as a result, the law was going to evolve. And that's exactly what we have seen happen from 2018, while ministers were talking about this in a small group, plus lots happening in academia, civil society, in the research and development space 
around artificial intelligence as a socio-technical construct, as well as you know a potential commercialization a series of commercial tools, and then through to get to ChatGPT in November 2022, the explosion of the commercialization of useful and sort of practical AI systems in a very sort of democratized way. And then fast forward again to the EU coming out with its Artificial Intelligence Act and a series of laws around the world that, that are now proliferating to govern those high risk use cases of artificial intelligence. So that was my entry point into it. And sort of the journey from, you know, the, the initial curiosity through to what I do now on a day-to-day -day basis, which is help organizations develop AI governance programs. Well, even just the way you described that, there was so much there. So I know this will be a gross oversimplification, but if you were just doing the law around, if I trip and fall, what is, what's liability? You know, those laws have been fairly well established for a pretty long time. And of course there's always new nuances, but it's, it's pretty much standard, but it seems to me, uh, you know, from just being in the practitioner side, that there's so much new in the world of data analytics and now particularly with AI and now generative AI, that's changing. And, you know, I read in the trade journals about new laws or proposed laws and regulations and so forth all the time. And so I've got to believe that this landscape is so complex for even yeah. you as a professional. So how do you, uh, how do you keep up on it? How do you help your clients actually keep up on all of this very complicated and ever changing legal landscape that's uh, with us globally today? You're, you're absolutely right, Bill. I mean, it is changing so quickly. We are, in a sense, in unprecedented territory. We haven't really governed a technology um, or the use case of a technology in this manner. Um, so, and, and certainly the nature of this technology, as I mentioned, it being sort of evolutionary, moving over to more autonomous systems. So we are in a little bit of unprecedented territory. And it is very challenging because of the way the law is evolving. You have draft laws on the books. You have some actual laws that have been passed. Illinois just passed a law on AI recently. Colorado has passed a law. You have a number of executive orders in the US um, that have come out to provide some kind of governance around AI. And it's happening even, so if you look at the US context, it's fascinating because in New York, it's happening at the city level. You know, New York City passed a law, an ordinance governing the use of AI in the employment context. So you're having this, these types of laws populate from the city through to the supranational, the sort of international level, and trying to keep a finger on the pulse is really tough. Frankly, I try to use AI to help me stay on top of it because I need it to be able to assess data sources and just try to sort out what seems right. Obviously, you align with a number of different industry organizations and trade associations that follow these types of um, processes so that you know you can stay on top of it. And then for my clients, the one thing, there are two things that we have organized in particular. Um, the first is we do, um, it was a small group of, of relevant practitioners, we have an AI roundtable where we get together and we just informally troubleshoot on various issues that we're dealing with so that we can take it back to our respective clients. And then uh, the other thing that we do is we are organizing at through my firm at Inc, an AI call-in series. So that will be throughout the fall where people can call in just to hear about A, what are some of the hot topics in governance, but then also what are some of the hot topics around the world? It forces us to stay current. The last thing we've done that I'm very excited about is as a law firm and a consulting firm, of which we are both, um, we have brought on an, an AI and ML engineering intern to help us sit down and sort of work through some of the issues, identify the great tools, experiment with the great tools in a responsible manner, try you know, walk the talk and, um, and really start to unpack some of the relationships between what's happening technically and what's happening in the governance space. So I'll say, I'm, I'm sure you haven't done this. I don't know if you saw the article about the lawyer in New York who used chat GPT to write up his case and it had a bunch of, of false things in it. That's uh, that had to be a pretty humiliating moment for that guy. 
I honestly, so we've had New York, we've had in British Columbia here, we had the same thing happen and it went straight up to a, a hearing before the, um, the self-regulating body, the law society. Um, and I was, uh, you know, giving presentations to some of our judges here through the National Judicial Council talking about that. And one of the questions that was raised was, you know, how do we know? Do we have, do we start to require the disclosure of use of generative AI in any materials that are brought before the court? My own view was, I don't think that's necessary. I think, you know, people should be held to the standard of professionalism and to put forward to a judge, a brief that you haven't read or verified, if it's an associate who did it or ChatGPT that did it, that's not a great practice. You should be able to stand behind anything you put before a client or a court. That is table stakes in law. It's funny, when, when I describe this, uh, that case study to people, I always say, so imagine you're this lawyer. He goes before a judge to beg, look, please believe that I didn't intentionally give you false information and mislead you because that'd be perjury, disbarment, all that. Rather, I'm simply an idiot who used a technology I didn't understand, didn't double check my work and submitted it to you. That's all it was. And so it's like, okay, so when you win that argument, you've still pretty much destroyed yourself. In it's the, a great victory, for in sure. Process. Yeah. So you mentioned a, a number of issues. What what today are maybe the, the specific one or two angles that seem to either a concern you most that you're bringing up with clients or that are concerning your clients most and that they're asking you about. Yeah. So there, I would say there are primarily maybe three major issues that our clients are dealing with. Uh, the first is that they are, so, so first of all, the, the personas that we are interacting with most are often the chief risk officer, compliance officer, privacy officer, or legal officer. Okay. So it's in the C-suite of that realm. And, Sometimes it is the chief data officer or the chief data um, and analytics officer. So um, it really does depend uh, where we're working, but typically it's that first group that I was talking about. And the, the number one thing that is, is starting to concern them is that their teams are using all of these tools and they have no idea or frankly visibility into how these tools are processing the data that they're being, that they're using as input data, what happens to the output data and what types of controls are in place for that output data um, in terms of how they're, it's, you know, it's being used internally. So that is one of the biggest concerning factors. And so one of the questions we get all the time is, can I use this tool based on these licensing terms? Mm -hmm. So we have to read the licensing terms and more often than not, it means I need to ask like, how are you intending to use the tools? What kind of information are you trying to put in there? What governance do you have in place to manage the outputs, the use of the outputs? And that really takes me into the second bucket of issues, which is um, our clients worry a lot about what kind of governance they have in place. So they appreciate that there are distinct risks to do with the use of artificial intelligence, especially gener generative AI in their workspaces. And they are being asked to or leading the process to put in place some kind of governance for those use cases. And what I always encourage them to do is First of all, don't build a new governance framework, just build on what you have, because what is in place is typically good enough from a data governance, data management, privacy, security perspective, and you're just augmenting to account for the specific risks of AI. But also, whatever is put in place has to be iterative, like you're going to have to work on it and review it quite regularly. So that's bucket number two. Bucket number three has to do with specific legal issues like copyright or intellectual property right or liability. And are these, you know, distinct areas of law sufficiently covered in the relationship between the AI vendor and the purchaser? And so those are some of the key concerns. Now, I will say the last issue that has come up more and more, which is interesting to me, is um, the notion of the ethics board and how do you construct an ethics review board? Um, and this is the reason I say it's interesting. I mean, it's a concept that's been around for a long time. So that part is not interesting. It's that it's coming up now. It's, you know, I would have thought that this is one of the earlier issues that companies are dealing with, 
but in fact, they are onboarding tools, they're dealing with broader governance issues first, they're worried about some of the distinct legal issues, and then they're stepping back and saying, oh, wait a second, we might need some kind of ethics review board. And so now let's talk about what that looks like. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the review boards. I've, I've been talking to companies about doing that for multiple years now. And it's one of my big closes. Like if I do one of my uh, ethics workshops, it's about the big, you know, the action steps at the end, set up that review board. And to your point, no one ever argues with that concept, but I'll be honest that it's also hasn't been that every company, even though they agree it's a good idea, has actually yeah. done it. So I'm glad if it's finally getting some of that attention, because a lot of these issues are so complex that, you know, while, yeah, there's always the legal aspect. What does the letter of the law say related to our liability here? But then there's the more subjective things like, well, if we did get in trouble here, what's our reputational risk or what do we, how bad do we think it would affect that that product roll up? Things that there's other people who need to have input into that process. And if you're not gathering that, you know, just having the purely legalistic, I think you still leave yourself exposed to other risks that are, you know, correlated with, but not the same. And, and just to add to that, because I think this is important, uh, we're, we f oftentimes I find that setting up the board becomes the action item, right? And that's actually not the point. It doesn't matter about setting, I, I don't really care how, what the construct looks like. What I care about is who is sitting around the table and what is their mandate. So the implementation part is the most important. It's all, often the hardest, especially to maintain over time. It's great to have your first meeting and then everyone feels good about the fact that they've had this first meeting and then nothing happens. But you know what we really try to impress upon our clients is that this, as we are, you know, we talk about this current era as a fourth industrial re revolution. And if that is the case, then culture needs to adapt within an organization to match the dynamic nature of how technology is integrating into our operations. So it's not just about a review board. That doesn't become the KPI that you can check off. It has to be the outputs of that review board and the ongoing sort of education and implementation and sort of maintenance of that board. It has to be a functional, useful, valuable board. I don't care that you created it, right? The, the, that yeah. fact alone is not interesting to me. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I guess it's kind of a variation on the classic. You don't want to just check the box. You want to actually be doing something uh, with it. Absolutely. So if, if you had to pick one or two things today that you think are the most urgent angles or, or aspects of AI that that needs to have some regulation, you know, finalized and maybe both locally finalized, like in Canada and the U.S., but also just kind of coming to some kind of, uh, you know, global consistency. What would be one or two of those angles that are eating at you most today? Well, I think if we're talking globally, um, I mean, one of the biggest concerns we have with the use of AI right now is in a sort of national defense and security measure, right? So how is how are these technologies being used in whether offensive, defensive, or training mechanisms for national security? That's a, a pressing issue that um, we 100% need to get ahead of, as well as the use of artificial intelligence to subvert cybersecurity infrastructure um, and critical infrastructure in particular. So those on, on sort of the socio social level, I would say those are some of the pressing issues. We also have some distinct concerns around the use of AI in anything related to mass surveillance where that just that just doesn't work in a democracy. It's it's just it's it runs counter to our values of freedom and independence. Um, so I think those are some of the big, really big issues for companies. If we bring it down to the sort of corporate level, for companies, I think some of the biggest issues have to do with actual meaningful adoption and identifying realistic ROI on the use of some of these technologies. Okay. There are inflated expectations that result in disappointment, that result in defunding some of these programs, and that's not helpful from a competitiveness perspective. So instead, standing up you know, good education programs, those culture changing activities that help us establish reasonable expectations, provide proper training for the use of whatever system you're intending to use, and then clearly communicating a realistic ROI is very, very important. At the same time, establishing your strategy 
that looks at elements of technology for sure. What technology do we need? What pain points are we solving? In addition to that culture piece, who's worried about this technology coming in? What are we going to do to potentially upskill or support some of our staff members who may not, who may be, you know, exercising activities that are now best done by artificial intelligence systems? We have to think about that as a culture. Um, and then how are we supporting these individuals in that next phase as we start to roll out some of these technologies and hopefully minimizing some of the anxiety around the use of these technologies. Uh, and then certainly putting in place some mechanisms to de-risk some of those higher risk use cases without feeling like everything that is labeled AI now needs major governance. And that's not the case. Really, we need to become sophisticated in assessing that risk spectrum. One thing, switching switching to a whole different uh, whole different topic. You know, regardless of someone's uh, career and background, not many people actually take that leap to start their own business. And so, I guess in my mind, I've, I've pictured lawyers being a little more towards the data science type people into the spectrum of maybe a slightly less, uh, I mean, slightly more risk averse than some. So, yeah. what led you to decide to take that leap to start your own business? And then, what have you learned through that process over the last uh, couple of years since you did that? So I, I keep saying I'm living my dream, like th that's it. I, I've, I'm now officially living my dream. Um, what, what led me to start my own business is I had wanted to do so for a while. I'd been working at a very large law firm here, great law firm, McCarthy Tetro, enjoyed it. And I had amazing colleagues. Um, and I was supported through my process transitioning from uh, litigation through to more of a lead on privacy and AI. So that there was tons of support in place for that. And But when I looked around and I looked at the market and I looked at two distinct factors, A, what is the overhead that you would need to sort of account for in your billings, right? So what is the amount of revenue you have to generate and what do you have to do to generate that revenue as we wait for you know, AI law or, you know, any type of need for AI related services to catch up. This is back in 2019. It just, the economics didn't make sense. And I knew that I didn't want to do secondary work uh, in order to make that billing target when I could be doing the work that I wanted to do. I met a wonderful partner and we started Inc. Law together. And it was, um, like it was, it, it didn't even cross my mind. Like I never even thought about it. I just sort of jumped out. Now, when I look back, I think, wow, that was nuts. I really should have given this <laughs> a little bit more thought, but thankfully I did it because it has all worked out and it's been an amazing journey. Um, but at the time it was just obvious to me. Like you look at the, what it means to stay in a big law firm, despite the support, you look at the market and how much need there is going to be coming down the pike. I also wanted something that is specialized. I don't want to do a hundred different things. I want to do a few things really, really well. I want to do privacy, cyber readiness, and AI risk management and AI strategy really, really well. That's all I want to do. And if you want to do that, then go do it, but you're best doing it on your own. Excellent. So across both your you know, your early work with the government and then at the big firm, and now you're on your own firm. What's a, what's a skill or trait you've got that you think has most helped you be successful in, in all of those roles? It's, you know, it's something you'll hear time and again, but it's just true. You have to be extraordinarily persistent and you literally have to be, I don't know, resilient is a word that is used so often. It sort of has lost its meaning. You, you have to not worry about failing or, being ignored or ghosted or like none of that has to matter with the drive behind wanting to achieve what you have in mind in for me is so dominant that it doesn't matter to me if things do or don't work out necessarily i want to understand why they didn't work out and then i can tweak for that but the fact that it didn't work out is not something that drags me down it's just an interesting data point that i can use as i try to optimize for my goal Actually, that's a that's a really interesting uh, angle there. It's a, I, I would say that's probably then puts you in a very positive thinking mindset more often than many. As you yeah. say, you know what? Yeah, this just sucked. I just lost that business and all. But I'm going to look at it at how I optimize it <laughs> instead of miring yourself in your misery over the yeah. lost opportunity. 
Always. That it happens. Listen, you're not going to get, we're out there pitching all the time. And sometimes what we have to be mindful of is that we're offering something that is valuable, but it's hard to test for that, right? Like you can try to do it in a Petri dish as much as you want, but then you, at some point you have to grow up and go into the real world and give it a shot. And the real world might tell you they don't care about this. Yeah. And that's interesting, right? It's not, it's just interesting. So let's figure out what they do care about. Yeah, I love I love that. I will say I've gotten better over the years at not letting, you know, things that go amiss get me get me down like they did when I was younger. But I don't know that I've been as successful at you as twisting myself into viewing it all positive at the time. <laughs> but there's still hope. There's still hope. You've given me a you've given me a new target now. You're my new Absolutely. standard. Um, so if, if you think today as as students are coming out of school and let's say more on my side of things, right? You're someone who wants to get a career in data and analytics and so forth. And they're thinking about a job. Is there anything from your perspective coming from the legal side that would be a good or bad area for them to focus on so that they can either, you know, take advantage of or avoid, you know, problematic parts of the regulations that are in place and coming down on us? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for that cohort of students, especially since there are um, there are a lot of people coming out in the market with this type of skill set. And I think what's really key. So from a, a regulatory perspective, the more that you are mature in understanding the F ethics and governance of these technologies, the more valuable you are to your organization, because the training from sort of no knowledge to appropriate knowledge is lessened for the company demonstrating that is super important so i think is certain you know it depends on the job you're applying for obviously but i think if you are able to demonstrate that you have the technical chops but you also have an understanding of how um your your sort of technical creations will be integrated in an organization and how and tying it directly to you know business decision making or problem solving like within operations. So making that link between the technical and the operations or the governance will be very valuable. When we just went through this exercise of trying to find our, um, our intern, we were, the thing that distinguished the intern for us was the fact that he not only had strong technical skills, but he also had uh, certificates in uh, analytics for business operations, analytics for decision making. And that to us was very compelling because the analytics on its own, especially because we can't, like we're bringing him in, but we don't have a CTO to oversee him, right? So we can't assess the the strength of his work. We And, and we're not as a result using him in that, in that capacity, but the fact that he has, <clears throat> pardon me, direct link to the technical from the technical to the decision making was very compelling because we knew we could integrate him more easily and he would match the culture more easily particularly in a smaller organization good perspective so let's finish real quick with just a, a thought you might have as you're looking forward now from today are there any aspects of the ethics and legalities around AI that you think are going to be hot that maybe haven't yet ramped up so that you think in you know two, three years from now, there's going to be a lot of focus on this or that area? There's going to be a lot more focus on uh, decision documentation. So we are going to, because of the EU Artificial Intelligence Act and different accountability frameworks that are being stood up, whether as law or as self-regulation, there will be, from a legal perspective, there will be a lot more emphasis on documentation. A lot of that documentation can be automatically generated, but it will need to be validated. So I think creating those structures and being mindful of how we become comfortable showing our decision-making or showing our steps will be very important. Excellent. Well, I know, I know you're busy because you have a business to run. So I want to thank you for taking the, the time out of your day to, to speak with me. I think you had some, some great insights uh, for the audience, and I appreciate you coming. Thanks for coming to the show. Always a pleasure, Bill. Anytime.